Welcome, everybody. My name is Pete, and I'm one of the pastors here at Creekside. Welcome to everybody watching online. You're joining us for week two of this series we're calling Getting Past Your Past. Because, guys and ladies, we all have a past. We all have a box. Imagine you were sitting with your box this morning. Someone goes, what's in that, what's in that box? Get away from my box. We all have a box like this. Filled with, filled with all the stuff that we've done. Filled with memories of what our life has been like so far. And it, it's like we carry this box around. And from time to time, we're not looking at our phone. You remember stuff that's in this box. And you look at it. And, you know, I have a box like this. Literally, I'm carrying this box. But I know that it's a, it's a metaphor. I have a box. I have a past. You know what? Sometimes I look into this box and I have memories and I, I go... You know, there's some, there's some stuff in here I'm kind of proud of. Oh, look at you, Pete. Look at that. Look at that one. There's one, one time in particular. One of Pete's more, one of his shining moments. It was caught on, caught on film. It was the, uh, the birth of our third child, our daughter. And she was born at home on purpose. <laughs> because the, the first one in the hospital was not exciting enough. So let's, let's amp it up a little. But we had this birth at home, and I, at this point, was a veteran in childbirth. I knew how things were going to go. I know how the female body works. <laughs> I will be there for you, honey. We took the classes. I knew. I knew what to do. And it was all captured on film. There was the, there was the moment when, when my wife got into the big tub. And you know what? I got right in there with her. And you know what's in that tub? Ugh. I don't either. But I know the color. I remember. And it's, but there's video of me in that tub with the cup of water. Just pouring that. You pour the cup of water on their belly. It makes all the pain go away. And I don't, I got you, babe. I got you. Then, then there was moments when she had to walk around and get some movement going, and so I, I swayed with her, just dancing like this. It's on video. <laughs> set, set to beautiful music. I know when other people watch the video, they're probably watching her, but I'm just watching Pete. I'm like, look at you. You are the greatest husband ever. I, I learned the move, you gotta push on their hips. This is key, guys, key. Push on the hips, takes all the pain away. I look at that moment, I'm like, man, Pete, you are one catch. Man. And then there's, uh, there's other moments in this box. There's other memories in here, like, well, like the birth of our first child, when I was no expert. This birth happened in the hospital. And you know what they got in hospitals that I don't like? Needles. And they brought out that one giant needle. And I could not be in the room because I was going to lose my cookies. <laughs> and there was many times when I couldn't be in the room because I was going to faint. And the nurses were like, we can't, we can't take care of you right now. <laughs> There's something else going on. Would you like your own room, perhaps? <laughs> and to be honest, I look at that Pete, and I'm like, I'm, not. I'm glad that one wasn't on video. We all have these mo moments I'm proud of, moments I'm not so proud of, moments where people hurt us, Things happen to us that hurt. There's moments in here that, man, I wish, if I could erase them, I would. If you could see them, I feel like it would change how you see me. You don't know those moments, but I know those moments. Moments like this, this, this box, it, it has power. It has power over us. Last week, Ken talked about guilt. Guilt. Guilt has to do with things that we've done, behavior that we've done. But at some point as we accumulate all these behaviors and all these things that we've done, at some point it, it's not just a feeling of guilt. Oh, I, I was wrong there. I shouldn't have done that. At some point these things all, you can kind of add them all up together and give them a shake and what you're left with is this is who you are. This isn't just a collection of things you've done. This is a collection that tells us who you are. And because there's, 
bad things in this box, shameful things in this box, they, they actually produce a sense of shame. There's things in this box that make me feel ashamed. Shame being different than guilt. Guilt being about things that I've done. Shame being about who I have become, who I am. So the question, if you could identify with this illustration is, what do you do with this box? What do you do with this shame-inducing box? Shame being that feeling of, I'm unworthy. If people knew what was in here, they wouldn't love me. I know what's in here, and I have trouble loving me. The things in here make me feel like I'm trapped. There, there's certain things in here that happen one time. There's other things that are like copied over and over and over because they're things that I keep doing over and over and over. And I'm like, how are there so many of those in here? And it makes me feel dirty, like I could never be clean. What do you do with this box that makes you feel ashamed? Some people will say, well, come on. I mean, because we all have one, just embrace it. We all have a box that, oh, yeah, we're ashamed of those things. But we all have got it. So just, just leave it open and just show people what's in there. Look at all the horrible things I've done. Oh, I know I'm a bad person. Just, just embrace it and, and get over it and just tell yourself, in spite of all these things, you are worthy. Ever try that one on? It doesn't it doesn't work because the things in here aren't just superficial stories about the birth of my children. There's deeper things in here that I can't just act like they don't affect me on my, at my deepest levels. So I can't just embrace it and just show everybody. Well, okay, well then maybe, maybe what we should do, we should ignore it. That's what we should do. We should ignore it. Put a lid on that box. We're just going to ignore it. Act like it didn't happen. You know what? We all got a box. You got to get over it, buddy. All right? You did some bad things. You should have seen the bad things I did. You put a lid on the box and you ignore it and you run away from it. And you run. But you know what happens when you try that method? This box has a GPS. <laughs> it's got like a homing device in it. And no matter how long you run, when you stop, you're like, there it is again. You know what this box does? It's like, it's, it's like it talks to you. Hey, Pete. Pete, remember what's in here? Oh, you're such a good Christian, are you? Let's open the box. No, don't open the box. I can't just ignore the stuff in the box. So, so you know where most of us land then? We do what's called numbing. I'm just going to try to numb the way that this box makes me feel. Numbing looks like every spare moment, I just bring up my phone. It will distract me. It will numb the feelings that I have. Numbing looks like movies, television, alcohol, drugs, spending, pornography. We pick our drug of choice in hopes, maybe this will take the pain away. And it does. But here's the problem with numbing, is that you can't selectively numb certain emotions. When you go down the path of numbing, you end up numbing all of your emotions. And so you wanna just numb the shame, but you can't just numb the shame. You're gonna end up numbing your joy as well. And so you will become a person who is disconnected from your past and disconnected from your emotions. What are we gonna do with this box? And here's the thing, the stuff I've been talking about so far only has to do with me looking at myself in the mirror and the feelings that I feel about the stuff in this box. What if I have an even bigger problem and it's not just the guy in the mirror? What if, what if there's a God who one day I'll have to stand before with my box? What if, what if one day I have to stand before a good, holy God with my box? 
Imagine the shame I'm going to feel then. This is what we find over and over throughout the scriptures is that when humans come in contact with God, they are ashamed. Sin brings shame upon us. The earliest humans, when they are first created and they walk with God in the cool of the garden, it says that they were able to walk with God and they were naked and unashamed. But after they rebel from God, after they put some stuff in this box that is ugly, now they, they are no longer able to be naked and unashamed and so they hide themselves, they cover themselves. They hide from God. When people meet Jesus, oftentimes they will use the language in the scriptures. Jesus, go away from me, I am unworthy. One guy even just sends a letter and he says, I don't deserve to like even be in your presence or have you come into my house because I am unworthy. What if, what if I don't just have a problem of the man in the mirror? What if I got a bigger problem and it's a good, holy God? What, what am I gonna do with this box? What am I gonna do with the shame that I feel from the things that I've put in here? What if, what if there was a way that someone else could put something in this box? that would somehow override what I've put in here. Because I don't think there's any way to erase it. I'm not gonna be able to erase my memory or erase the things that have happened in my past. There's no way of getting rid of them. But what if there was a way to like override them? What if, what if there was a way that the stuff that I put in the box gives me an identity of shame, being ashamed? What if someone else could put something in the box that would give me a new identity, one where I don't have to be ashamed? This is the amazing story of what Jesus does for us. Jesus comes and he takes our sin and our shame upon himself and he carries it far away. And he doesn't just forgive us of those things. He also sets us free to live a new identity in him, connected to him. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we trust in him, it's like we're putting something new in our box that overrides all the stuff that we put in our box and it gives us a new identity. The Apostle Paul, who wrote for us much of our New Testament, uses this as one of his mega themes. This idea that when Jesus comes into our life and we attach ourselves to him through trusting in him, that we get a new identity. You can find it so often throughout his letters. I just wanna give you a snapshot of a couple of the ways that he says it. In his second letter to the Corinthians, he says it this way, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has attached themselves to Jesus, if anyone has, has put their trust in what he does for us on the cross, taking our sin and shame away, well, then what has happened to them is a new creation has come. The old has gone. The new has come. There's a shifting of identity taking place. In his letter to the Galatians, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The old me that put all the stuff in here that brought me shame, that guy, he's been crucified. That's what it means to put your trust in Jesus. You say, Jesus, I would like the old me that did all the stuff that brings me shame. I would like that me to symbolically be put on the cross with you. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. There's a new me living. Christ lives in me. The life I, la I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Romans, he says it this simply, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When I'm just carrying the box with all the stuff I put in it, condemnation. I am unworthy. But when I get to carry the box with Jesus, with my new identity, with the cross covering all the stuff that I put in it, 
Well, now there is no condemnation. And what's interesting about Paul is that he doesn't just say this about all the bad stuff. He doesn't just, he's not just referring to like all the stuff that you put in the box that is bad, that will no longer define you. He also says, and all the stuff that you thought was good, all the good stuff that you tried to do, that also will no longer define you. He says it in Philippians this way. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. All the stuff that I did, all the stuff that I earned, I no longer even attach that to my, identi my identity. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. All the stuff I put in the box, even the good stuff, garbage. I won't let it define me compared to knowing Jesus, to know him and to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, not having earned my right relationship with God, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. My righteousness will not come from the stuff that I put in the box. My righteousness will come from what Jesus puts in the box. So to add another symbol for us this morning, I took this off of my son's window. He got this at the dollar store once. And uh, immediately upon choosing this as what he wanted, he was going around, bless you. <laughs> bless, bless you. So it's the biggest cross that I could find in our house. And so there's all the stuff I put in the box. And from that stuff, I get an identity that I am ashamed of. But when I put my trust in Jesus, it's like I'm, I'm attaching myself to him. It's like I'm putting the cross into my box. And now it's like something has happened that overrides all the stuff that I did. It doesn't erase it. We don't pretend like it's not there. It's still there. Pete still did that stuff. But that stuff no longer defines me. Now I'm defined by the cross of Jesus. Now I'm defined by my connection to him. And what that means is that when that voice comes, that voice, when the box starts talking, when that box is like, Pete, don't remember, don't forget what's in here. Don't forget all the stuff that's in here. Don't forget, you've been a bad boy. You know that voice. It doesn't sound that cute. When that voice starts talking, you don't just say, no, you're wrong. No, you can say, you're right. There's a whole bunch of bad stuff in that box, but don't forget what else is in this box. Because the stuff that the voice is bringing up doesn't define you anymore. This defines you. It's, uh, there's, a, there's a great story of St. Augustine, and it may just be a story, but it's great nonetheless, that he lived a life of promiscuity before he became a follower of Jesus. And one day he was walking down the street and one of his mistresses called out to him, Augustine, it is I. And he turned because he had started to walk away from her. He turned and said, ah, but it is not I. She was calling out because she recognized the old him. And he's like, that Augustine doesn't exist anymore. This could be beautiful for us if we get how this could look in community. Because there's one thing to say like, I have a past, but you know what? We just, we put a lid on it and I refer to it in like ambiguous terms. But that can lead to like a, a hypocritical version of Christianity. Because we wanna distance ourselves so far from it and we wanna, we wanna pretend like we're all perfect now. But I don't know about you guys, I, I haven't reached the perfection level yet. And so what I think would be much more helpful rather than having like a lid on our past, is if there was a way to keep the lid off the box and yet not have it bring us shame. When we talk about getting past our past, I think to truly say I have gotten past my past is to say I'm so past it, I can show you it and I'm unaffected. Because as I'm showing it to you and you're like, how come these things don't weigh you down? How come you're not prisoner to these things? How come they don't bring you shame? You go, oh, because there's another thing that happened in my past. And this part of my past is the thing that defines me. It's not the stuff I put in the box. It's the stuff that God put in 
the box. There's things that have happened in my past that I didn't do, that I didn't put in here. And that is now where I get my identity from. Imagine what Christianity would look like, what churches would look like if we all walked around with a box that looked like this. Oh man, you should, you should, you should have known me. Oh man, oh, and I'm st- by the way, I'm still struggling with X, Y, Z. But I'm so free. I am so free from shame, you wouldn't believe it. Let me tell you how this works. You may, you may wonder like, I don't know, I don't know if we, I don't know if we're ready for that. I don't know if we're ready. Every, next Sunday, everyone bring a box with the worst things in it. I don't know, but I'll tell you, there's at least one place in this church where that happens regularly. And it's a ministry called Celebrate Recovery. And it's a ministry that happens here every Friday night throughout the whole year. And you can find it on our website under the What's Happening page. But this is a community of people who are learning how to get past their past, how to get past their hurts and their habits and their hangups and how to put on this new identity in Jesus. They don't ignore the past. They just put on a new identity in Christ. And if you have that feeling of like, I have that box of shame, I strongly encourage you to check out Celebrate Recovery on Friday nights. Now to end this morning, I wanna tell you a story from the scriptures that to me illustrates everything that we've been talking about so far today. Where did I put the clicker? There it is. I wanna tell you a story that I think illustrates everything that we've been talking about today. And it's one of my favorite stories. And it's one of my favorite stories because, well, it's about Peter. And if you haven't been paying attention, my name is Peter. And there's something about when your name is in the Bible that when you read the stories that they speak to you and it's much more easy, easier to put yourself in those stories. But I hope that as I tell this story that you'll be able to find yourself in the place of Peter and perhaps be set free from any shame that you have brought in here this morning. When we first meet Peter, he's fishing. He's fishing with some other friends on a boat and Jesus comes to him and he's been fishing all night long. And he's on shore and he's like cleaning up his nets and he didn't catch anything all night long. And Jesus tells him, why don't you push out one more time and throw your nets down one more time and see, see what happens. And for some reason, Peter obliges this request from a unknown rabbi. And he puts down the net and he experiences this miraculous catch of fish. So much fish they can barely get it all into the boat. And when he has this moment with Jesus... He doesn't say, oh, thank you, Jesus. I mean, I I was clearly like waiting for my miracle and finally my miracle showed up because I was worthy of a miracle. He doesn't say that. He says, Jesus, get away from me because I'm a sinful man. What he says to Jesus upon experiencing this miracle is Jesus, I have a box that brings me so much shame that in your presence right now, I would prefer that you go away because I feel naked and I am ashamed. But Jesus says to him, no, 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 you are gonna now come and follow me. And Jesus gives him a new identity. He says to Peter, you will no longer fish for fish. From now on, you will fish for people. Peter says, I got a box with all this stuff I put in it. And Jesus comes to him and says, I'm gonna put something new in it. I'm calling you to a new identity. You, from now on, will fish for people. And then Peter walks with Jesus for some three years and he learns how to be a disciple of Jesus. He learns about this kingdom movement that Jesus is bringing into the world. He learns what King Jesus will be like and is like. And he walks with Jesus for three years. But then Jesus is arrested and he's tried. And we get a scene in John chapter 18 where it's kind of like two things are simultaneously happening. One is that Jesus is being questioned and he's being beaten. And then just off somewhere like kind of in view of this, Peter's gathered around a fire with some servants and some guards. And he knows what's happening to Jesus. And, and at some point, like a, like a little servant girl asks him, hey, you, oh, you know him. You know the guy that's being questioned and beaten in there, right? You know, and Peter says, no, I didn't know. 
No, hmm? No, no, I don't, I, I don't know him. And then they keep warming themselves by the fire. And then they ask again, you know, no, you know him. No, my, and then they ask again, no, no, my cousin. My cousin was there when you chopped off the guy's ear. You, we, you know him. And three times Peter says, I, I, I don't know. And when Peter does that, I want you to imagine that he is placing something in this box that he will never forget. The shame of this moment will never go away for him. Imagine when he says it that third time, I didn't know him, and then the rooster crows, and it's like it locks it in for all time. I am gonna carry this memory for the rest of my life. And then Jesus dies. But then he resurrects from the dead. And then he appears to Peter and some of the other disciples in an upper room. And we're not told a lot about what happens there. We're not told about the individual disciples, but I like to picture it this way, that, that Peter has still some unresolved shame. And so Jesus shows up and he speaks to the disciples, peace. And I just picture Peter in the back of the room holding his shame because his last most powerful memory of Jesus was when he betrayed him. And maybe like Jesus shows up and he had a bit of a speech and then at some point Peter's like, hey, well, Jesus, could we just talk about this for a second? And then Jesus is gone. And then a week later it happens again. He shows up in a room with the, where the doors are locked and Jesus, peace be with you. And then Peter's like, okay, Jesus, can we just, I just would like to address this. And then Jesus is gone. And like, Man. And maybe he felt like, oh, that's what I deserve. Probably, I'm probably just gonna have to carry this around for the rest of my life. I guess I blew it. Like he showed up once and gave me a miracle. I walked with him for three years and saw miracles. I guess I've just blown this opportunity. And the next time that we see Peter, in John chapter 21, he's back in Galilee. He's back where Jesus first called him. Have you ever been back to a place that you never thought you'd be back to? I can't believe I did that again. I can't believe I clicked on that again. I can't believe I said those words to them again. But I'm back here and Peter is back in Galilee. He's back fishing. Jesus said, from now on you will fish for people. And Peter is back fishing. But Jesus has not given up on Peter. And so after a night, another night of fishing and catching nothing, they see a man out on the shore. They don't recognize that it's Jesus, but Jesus yells to them, put down the net on the right side. To which I'd imagine somebody said like, oh yeah, the right side. But for some reason they do it and they have a miraculous catch of fish. And then upon this miraculous catch of fish, Peter, it says he, he, he wraps his coat around him, I don't know why, and jumps into the water and he's gonna swim to Jesus because he was probably way younger than we often imagine him and he's so impulsive. But I also like to imagine that he's still carrying this box around. He's still, he's swimming with this box because he's like, maybe if I get to shore first, I could have a moment with Jesus and we could talk about this and I could find out like, am I in, am I out? What's gonna happen? Like, what do we do with the thing that I did? Like, you know, you obviously, you rose from the dead. You obviously know that I denied you three times. But John doesn't tell us that he got to shore early. It just says that when they got to shore, they saw that Jesus had a fire going. Jesus had a fire going and he says, get some of the fish and come and have breakfast. And it seems as though Jesus then prepares and serves them breakfast. It kind of makes me think that there would be echoes in their minds of, of the time when Jesus washed their feet. This unexpected, why is the master serving us? And I imagine the awkwardness the whole time of Peter being like, okay, okay, we're gonna, show, okay, you're gonna, no, let me make the fish. No, okay, I gotta, let me clean up. No, okay, just, okay, can we talk about it? And Jesus is like, let me serve you. Imagine the tent, like Peter says, I just wanna, I just wanna know do I carry this shame forever or is there something else that's gonna happen here? And after serving Peter, Jesus says, okay, Peter, you wanna talk what's in the box? 
Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me more than these, he says. And we're not sure what he means by these. He might have meant the fish. He might have meant his old life. He might have meant the other disciples there. Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Jesus, you know that I love you. And then Jesus says, good. Take care of my lambs. Feed my lambs. At which point Peter must have felt, oh, thank goodness. My calling is still in place. The identity that he gave me is still in place. Oh, okay, thank you. And I imagine he'd been like, thank you, Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Oh, we just talked about that. I do, yes, I do. You know that I love, you know it. I just said it and you already knew it before you asked. You know it. Jesus is like, then take care of my sheep. And then I imagine he's like, so good to be free. And, and Jesus is like, Peter, do you love me? And when he asked the third time, it says that it hurt Peter. It hurt him because he denied Jesus three times. And now Jesus is, is acting, he's bringing it up three times. He's asking, do you love me three times? Peter replies a third time, Jesus, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, good, take care of my sheep. What is Jesus doing in this moment? Is he rubbing it in? Is that who Jesus is to you? You mess up when he comes, he's the Jesus that likes to rub it in, make you, make you feel as terrible as possible. No. Jesus is recreating a moment. Peter, you put a whole bunch of stuff in this box. You, put a, you took the moment where you first met me and I called you and then you, and then you lost that somehow. So let me recreate that moment where you first experienced my, my goodness, my miracles. Let me recreate that moment for you. Peter, you were once gathered around a fire. By the way, John uses a word only twice in his gospels. It's the word that we often interpret as fire, but it's actually heap of coals. In John chapter 18, when Peter denies Jesus three times, it says that he is gathered with other servants, warming himself around a heap of coals. The only other time John uses that word is when Jesus builds a fire and cooks breakfast around a heap of coals. Peter, you, you, you kind of lost the moment of your original calling, so I'll recreate that miracle. Peter, you had a moment where you, where you denied me three times around a heap of coals, so I will now recreate a moment around a heap of coals where you affirm how much you love me. It's like he's saying to Peter, Peter, if you never saw me again, you would have carried this around your whole life and been haunted by it. This would have haunted you. Every time you went fishing, you would have remembered how you messed up. Every time you smelt a fire, every time you saw fire, you would remember how much you messed up and you would be filled with shame. It's like he's saying, Peter, you put all these things in this box. Let me come to you now and put something new in that box. Now, when you fish, you'll remember, you can't outrun my love. I'll keep finding you every time you go back to fishing. Now, every time you're around a fire, you'll remember how you messed up, but you'll also remember how I came for you and I called you again. You're still mine. You'll feel that shame try to speak to you but then you'll also hear my voice with more power and more authority say, take care of my sheep. I still have a purpose for you. Jesus has come and had breakfast and he recreates this moment. And then he asks Peter the only question that matters. Do you love me? It's a question about focus. When Peter was gathered around the fire and he denied Jesus, he was focused on himself. He was worried about himself. What's gonna happen to Peter if Peter says that he knows Jesus? He's probably gonna find himself with you. He was focused on himself and Jesus says, stop looking at you. Stop looking at being concerned with what's gonna happen to you. Do not look inward to find worth and oh, maybe I look in and there I'm enough. No, you are not enough. You are not worthy. But if you look at me, and if you love me, 
then you will find that you are caught up by that love. And in that love, you will be given a new identity. Is there anybody that came in this morning carrying a box, a burden, shame? It's so heavy. You had it covered up and you're like, nobody else knows, right? Nobody else knows? Okay. And Jesus is inviting you. Come and have breakfast. Come and have, put the box down. Let's have breakfast. What is breakfast? Breakfast is a, a chance at a new beginning. Come and have breakfast and let me serve you. Let me show you how good I am. And then after breakfast, after I've revealed to you how good I am, I have one question for you and it's the only question that matters. Do you love me? And if you can say yes to that, then it doesn't matter what you put in this box 10 years ago, and it doesn't matter what you put in this box 10 hours ago. Those things no longer define you. You are now defined by your love for Jesus, and you will be caught up in him and find a new identity in him, and you will be set free from shame. Let me pray for you before we go. Jesus, thank you that you come to set us free. Thank you that you call us. Thank you that your calling on us is so much greater than anything that we have done. Oh, Jesus, we just breathe in your goodness. We thank you that you keep finding us in the places that we run from you. We thank you that your desire for us is not just to be forgiven, but to be set free. And today we confess, many of us, for the thousandth time and some of us for the first time, we love you. We love you. Make us new. We trust you. Help us to see ourselves in you. And from that derive our identity. Holy Spirit, speak these things into our soul and empower us to live in them. We ask for them in the strong resurrected name of Jesus. Amen.